Hey guys, welcome to the podcast for people obsessed with the mad pursuit of spearfishing. If you're here for the first time, welcome along. My name's Isaac, aka Shrek. I'm the host of this crazy thing called the Noob Spiro Podcast. It's where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities, and characters from around the world and share those interviews for free wherever people can download podcasts, whether you're listening on Spotify, iOS, uh, Jeepers, there's a whole lot, whole bunch of quality podcast apps out there. I'd encourage you to find one, subscribe. Just want to thank all the people on social media and the comments. There's always people with questions about spearfishing. There's a massive learning curve, as you, as everyone knows, that's been doing it a while. And uh, there's always new uh, questions from people that are newer in their first couple of years. Uh, I love it when I see, you know, listeners uh, mentioning, yeah, listen to the Noob Spiro podcast, have a listen to this episode here. Um, there's tons of information in there. And today's episode hopefully will serve as one of those type benchmark episodes for people interested in smoking fish. We're off to chat with Michael Ispy from Matakana Smokehouse in New Zealand. And uh, we get down and, and pretty geeky into um, smoking fish, the art of smoking fish. So we talk about what type of smokers from basic to high end. We talk about preparation of fish before, what kinds of fish work better. We talk about brine, dry brine, wet brine, rubs and ingredients, uh, serving different types of culinary dishes and creations you can make and it's an absolute cracker. I just wanted to, uh, before we get there, I just wanted a special mention and thank you to Robin Cornelan who's editing this podcast. He's the producer for this episode end to end. So welcome aboard Robin. Thanks for your hard work mate. Let's get into this episode. Michael Isby from Matakana Smokehouse in New Zealand. Thanks for Blair for um, putting me on to Michael. Had an absolute mad chat with him. Let's get into it. This episode of the Noob Spirit Podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. They've been on board for more than 100 episodes, and I'd love for you to shop at spearfishing.com.au. They have a price beat guarantee, hassle free returns, flat shipping rates across Australia, and you can save 20 bucks. For every purchase over $200, if you use the code Noob Spirit, you save $20. Thanks for supporting the Noob Spirit Podcast and shopping with spearfishing.com.au. Welcome to the Noob Spiro Podcast. If this is your first time listening to the show today, you're in for a bit of a treat. We're going to talk smoked fish with Michael, the owner and operator of the boutique Smokehouse, New Zealand foods finalist, Matakana Smokehouse. I have been in, stopped in and uh, visited Michael and um, and had the pleasure of meeting him in person. So it's, it's great to get you on the show, Michael. I told you I was going to do this to you. Yes, you're, you're quite correct, Shrek. You're a man of your word. Uh, I was a bit hesitant as to whether you would follow up on your uh, on your promise, but you're true to your word. So, um, so I look, I'm, it's 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 a real honour to be here. To be fair, um, there's a lot of legends of, of the spearfishing world have been here before. So, um, to uh, to to participate is it's great. Thank you. So Blair Herbert is a kind of our mutual acquaintance, and while I was in New Zealand, I shot a was lucky was privileged enough to shoot a, a big kingfish and um, I got told to stop in at your smokehouse and uh, perhaps you'd be able to help us out and you did in gentlemanly fashion to help us cut it up and cry, uh, cry back um, the kingy so I could bring it back to Aussie so um, thank you for that sir. Well, we're going to help out uh, you know a fellow Spiro. I was super surprised like um, you picked me straight away you were like eh, Shrek and I was like yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> so it's funny good. Um, it was yeah. That was that was a neat little feature of my um, my trip there in early March. So um, no, it was cool. And that fish made it all the way back um, okay, actually. And uh, my mate smoked a bit of it for me, and it and it came up bloody good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I mean, it makes a big difference when when a fish is cryovac or, or vacuum packed, as you as you say. Um, you know, it really protects it and and creates a good storage sort of feature for it. So um, makes a difference. It seems to freeze better too if you vacuum pack it. Is that you'd agree with that? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, being able to remove all that air uh, mm. out from any contact with the fish is what um, creates that good barrier and allows it to freeze really well. It's just it's it's restricting that freezer burn, and freezer burn happens when uh, you've got air in contact. Um, so effectively, really, really cold air. Uh, and obviously having that plastic barrier uh, eliminates a lot of that. I was rifling through my chest freezer just before. There's some big old frames there. I was going to, 
I've got ambitions of doing something with it. Like I've got a big skull there and I've a big um, Spanish mackerel and I was thinking about boiling it and doing the skull up and gluing it and stuff. Um, with all the fish you go through and fish frames and stuff, I mean, what do you do with it there at the smokehouse? Do you sell it as stock or uh, like stock for soup or what's the sort of deal there? Well, when it comes to, to smoking, um, and that's the great thing about smoking, is that most of the whole carcass can be used. So when guys bring in uh, whole fish, um, you know, often they want the head back. Um, they want everything back, the wings, uh, the frame. It can all be smoked and it can all be you know, taken away by the, by the customer and, and, and utilized in some way. Mm. So, I mean, to be fair, I do ask a lot of the guys. Well, it's better for them, for the customer coming in, to just bring me fillets. Um, so that's it's, and then there's very little waste. Mm. Um, but we don't, we don't make stocks or anything, uh, at this stage, um, mm. with what we, with what we get left over. We do have a, um, a couple of guys who come in and take them for, for fish burley, um, and things like that. So it all gets used some way mm. or another. It's fantastic and fantastic compost or whatever as well. Like my mate's growing a garden out of the stuff here in Queensland and the soil here's pretty rubbish, but he's growing some fantastic veggies out of all the fish frames he's put through. Um, his his soil. Yeah, that's another that's another great use. Um, so Matakana Smokehouse, how long has it been going? Where are you located exactly for for people that aren't familiar? Well, the Matakana Smokehouse has been going for uh, it's probably been about fifteen years. We've owned it for about four and a half years. Okay. So, you know, as a lot of um, you know young people do, they when they get home from overseas, they you know, need a job, need a business, need something to do, and and it was the same with us. My wife and I, we got home from overseas and and, we're, and wanted to live in the area because this is where I'm I'm from is, is this area. So mm. um, we just came across the business actually through the the local farmers market. The the previous owner was had this had a stall at the farmers okay. market, and we were working at the market selling beer, and learned that the market that the smokehouse was for sale. And made inquiries and bought it. Yeah, right. It was it wasn't being run in a, in a great way under the the old guy. He was yep. he had other interests. He was sick of it. Um, so there was a lot of potential there for us. And you know, would like to to sort of think that we've we've increased it and grown it and and made use of that potential mm. um, over the last um, you know four years coming up five years. Yeah, man. Okay, I didn't realise that um, it was a pre-existing business that when you bought it. So that's interesting. Um, judging by your social media, you guys have started getting pretty creative with the old uh, seafood dishes. So um, h- how's that journey sort of transpired? Uh, well, that's that's still been part of it, and and, that, and and part of the reason why we got into the business. Um, one, you know, part of the reason is that. We're, my wife and I, we both enjoy, we enjoy food. We're interested in food. We like cooking. Mm. Um, there's always been that, that, um, that passion for it, I suppose. And even, even smoking, um, smoking fish. I mean, as a young fella, um, like literally, you know, eight, 10, 11, you know, I'd be taking apart, you know, 44 gallon drums and, and, um, old hot water cylinders and, and <laughs> trying to make smokers and, you know, burning shit down, the all fires <laughs> getting out of control. Um, so literally, and this was, you know, so it's been a, a sort of an interest of mine. You know, I'd, I'd always love sitting down and, and, and smoking fish. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was a good fit. That's what was, the business was a good fit. We like food, you know, I've, I enjoy smoking fish and um, we live, it was good, you know, it was in the area where we live and it's a good area. Um, so it was I a good like fit how you us. said, um, I enjoy smoking and and you paused for quite a while there so I can edit in whatever the hell I want. So thanks yeah. for that. <laughs> but but um but but paralleling your um sort of smoked fish journey, you've also been an avid um spearer. You you've been quite into your spearfishing for a number of years. Tell us a little bit about that. How long have you been spearing for? I first started spearing pretty early on. Um you know, like a lot of guys, my dad, he was a he was a big um, he was a big scuba diver, but he yeah. always had a spear gun. Okay. Um, definitely in his younger years, he was he would do a bit of spearing. Mm. Um, so we started scuba diving, you know, from about 15, 16. And, you know, around that same time, 
even earlier possibly, I'd take his old spear gun out, um, you know, and shoot, you know, like when you're a young fella, anything. Um, yeah, red mokey. And, and literally, and then I'd smoke it up and, you know, no matter what you shoot, whether it be a drummer or, um, you know, dare I say it, a red mokey. Butterfish. Um, Butterfish. Butterfish, yeah. Um, they all smoke up quite well. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so started spearing quite early and then – you know, you go to high school, you go to university, and the the spear fishing took a back seat. Scuba diving, I always kept going. Okay. Always scuba dive quite a bit, and then it wasn't until uh, my wife and I bought a yacht uh, in the Caribbean um, that spear fishing really came back into it. Um, we spent two years sailing sailing back from the Caribbean to New Zealand. Wow! And and yeah, it was a good journey. It was a good mission. And, um, you know, I went to some pretty remote places. So spearing fish was a key part of, of the day, really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was what you did to get your lunch, to get your dinner. So since, since then, since I've got back home, yeah, spearing's really um, been probably the number one pursuit for me. Mm. Well, it pairs well with the business, doesn't it? Well, it does. And, and I've met some really good dudes and really good local sparrows through the business. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of the guys who I who I'm in contact with and, and, and go spearing with, I've met through through them bringing fish to me. So that side of it's been been great. So I mean, spearing in the Caribbean, I'm I'm sort of picturing you guys sort of more spearing for a subsistence sort of feeding yourselves sort of level rather than a sporting, you know, maybe um, trophy type focus. But how does it stack up to spearing in New Zealand? What are some of the parallels and things you learned along the way? Uh, well, to be fair, most of the spearing we did was in the Pacific. Okay. We, we'd actually spent quite a bit of time in the, in the Caribbean working on super yachts. So once we sort of bought the yacht, it, we pretty much beelined it straight for Panama through the canal. And then as soon as you got through that Panama Canal into the Pacific, even on the Panama coast, the spearing could be pretty awesome. Yeah, right. Eh? And... And then down into the Galapagos, which obviously is a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a, a, a reserve, so you can't do a lot of spearing there, and you actually can't move around a lot on a boat in the Galapagos. It's all pretty um, protected. Um, but then once you got to, you know, your, your outer reaches of French Polynesia, your Marquesas, and then your Tuamotus, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing spearing. You know, we were, as you said, we weren't there for the trophy hunting, hmm. but compared to New Zealand, um, I mean, it's different. You know, it's, it's a lot of Trevally, you know, a lot of Trevally, Bluefin, Big Eye, Trevally. Uh, and then once you get down into the more the coral, you know, the Tuamotus, you've got your, your um, coral trout, jobfish, things like that. So, mm. Emperor. and the sharks. I mean, the sharks is a, is a massive feature of French Polynesia, especially. Mm. You know, they're, they're pretty abundant there. Have you ever smoked a shark? I'm not shit staring you. No, 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 I haven't. But I've heard. I've heard that, that um, I know Marco has been said to smoke up quite well. Yeah, the, pro- the problem with Marco is I, I think they legitimately are quite threatened. Their numbers seem, don't seem yeah. as strong as some of the other sp- shark species I, I've yeah. seen. It's still a sport. It's still considered a sports fish in lots of parts, many parts of the world, though, isn't it? Like they're, they go apeshit, I think, when they catch them on a line. Um, so I think that's the appeal for sports fishers. We, they do. And I, to be fair, I mean, I haven't heard of uh, a Marco being, being smoked recently, but you get times where, you know, you get certain seasons where Marcos do get caught quite often as a bycatch of, of marlin. Okay. And also you get them even out again when you're live baiting and things like that. They'll come on and, and, and if the guys aren't using circle hooks, which is a different story, then they can get, they can get gut hooked and then they, they die. So, um, no, haven't smoked a shark yet. Mm, okay. All right, so that's on the cards for this year. I'm, I'm taking it. Well, you know, someone wants to <laughs> knock one of those one of those dirty bronzies on the head that keep giving us grief, then um, I'll happily smoke that up. Yeah, no, I think the mercury content in the larger sharks is kind of makes takes them out of the equation. But um, there's some dim views around shark fishing of any form in recent years, and I don't know that all of the negative attention is warranted. I think um, people should be a little bit more objective about how we classify and think about them it's not just all the sharks we should protect them all it should be okay which ones are 
are, are able to be harvested commercially for, for, for food, you know. But anyway, yeah. that's neither here nor there. I'm always just starting ship fights, as you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to um, sort of progress straight into um, the Veterans Vault. The section, obviously, for this episode is The Art of Smoking Fish, I've titled it. So um, can, we, can we hook straight in? Sure. All right. So smokers, um, you're, you're the purveyor. What, what do you call yourself? Uh, 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 what, what, what's the technical term for a person who smokes fish? I'd like, I'd like to say, Shrek, that there is some fancy oh, come uh, up with one. Pro- professional sounding uh, name, but uh, at, at this stage, I'm, I'm, I'm still just a, a fish smoker. Um, oh, no, you've got to do better than that. You, you could have had a term here. I can come back to you with some uh, with some term, but I'll have to I'll have to do some research on it. I think. Yeah, do you incorporate your name in it somewhere. You've got to get you know some some credit out of it. Um, but okay, so you you you've you you know you fish you cook you smoke fish for a living. Um, so, um, but I wanted to talk about the equipment for smoking. So from from a consumer point of view, um, what are the sort of the options that um, people should think about? Um, and, and, and what are the purchase costs and things like that? Well, you've got a good range of, of smokers, home smokers on the market um, these days. You know, you've got everything from your small little stainless box that you um, use meths to, to fire that up um, for, you know, 40 bucks, right up to your, your Bradleys um, and your Webers and, and, and things like that, which are, you know, up to a couple of grand. And then you've got your, you know, that new sort of style these days with your, your sort of Texas barbecue style smokers, which, you know, they're, they're more designed, in my opinion, for, for meat, um, you know, that sort of... Gr- Thick cuts of meat. Yeah, your slow cook, um, you know, meat cuts. But in saying that, you've got, you know, new ones. Uh, it's more, it's, it's, I just don't feel that they have, um, you can get the, the heat low enough. Yeah. Which is fine for hot smoking, but I, have, I, I always believe that the longer you can smoke something, the better. And if you can keep those temperatures really low for, for, for as long as you can, uh, I feel you, you can end up with a, with a good product. Mm. Um, uh, and those things like the Bradleys and, and the Webers and those UFOs, they, they, they're good. I mean, those are your, your, your best options, uh, unless you want to make something yourself. So price price points. What's a um, what's something that you, so, so someone that knows nothing about smoking fish they they want to give it a crack? Um, is one of those little stainless boxes with the with the meth? Uh, is that is that kind of where you'd suggest someone started, or or what do you recommend? It's a good place to start. It's a good place to start. Um, the as you say, cheap, um, and you can experiment a bit with your recipes. They are very limited. Um, you are very limited. You're not going to get. Uh, you're never going to smoke longer than about thirty to forty minutes. Okay. But that's their beauty: is that you know they, you can get a really good tasting product, you know, in, in half an hour, forty minutes. But it's a different product to, you know, a, a well cured fish that's been smoked for three to four to four to five hours, mm. um, which is where your Bradleys uh, and your Webers come in. You've also got your UFOs, those egg shaped smokers, and I'm sure there's lots of other ones out there that I, that you know I haven't come across with uh, at this time. You're at a different end of town too now. Like, um, what's what's your setup? Yeah, so we've got a big. Uh, it fits two trolleys. Each trolley is um, probably five feet high. Uh, each trolley fits. Well, we do about fifty kilos of fish. In each trolley, so you're looking at about 100 kilos. Wow. Um, you've got uh, reverse, um, not reverse, horizontal airflow. So your okay. smoke uh, and heat comes horizontally across the fish and then up through um, the, the chimneys. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big, I mean, you can, that, that, if you were to buy that new now, you're looking at, um, you know, 120 grand. Holy moly. Yeah, and then, and that's not even the, the biggest of the biggest, you know, your big guys like your, um, you know, for New Zealand here, your Regal, King Salmon, you know, they've got millions of dollars worth of smoking equipment. Hmm. So, yeah, it's, we might, I'm not sure if we'll get to it, to, we'll get to it later, but um, airflow is, is a big one when it comes to smokers. Hmm. 
you need airflow effectively. I, I feel that some of these, you know, Bradleys and Webers and they things get a bit steamy in there. Um, yeah. and you don't want steam. You don't want that moist, steamy air. So you want to be able to let that steam escape and if possible, you want a good breeze okay. going through the fish, across the fish. Often you can buy you can buy little fans yeah. uh, from your little from any electrical supplier, um, and if you fit those in some way where they're not going to get dripping, you know, drips on them, either coming in from from the side, bottom, top doesn't really matter. Just want some airflow going across the fish, and that'll really help final product. Okay. Um, so wick, it's also part of wicking that moisture off the mm. off the fish, keeping the fish dry. Yeah, so airflow is a big one. Josh, Josh Nyland talks a little bit about that in his book, um, the Whole Fish Cookbook, which I've I swear I've mentioned for about ten episodes in a row. However, at the risk of killing it, um, that's something that we chatted about. I think briefly while I was there. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean he's worth talking about. To be fair. What he's doing with fish is is it really is next level. He's re- it's in my in my mind he's reinvented um, how fish can be prepared and cooked. I suppose his main well for my, for me his main takeaway is is aging the fish. Hmm. I mean that's quite a it's quite a new concept really is is I think for a lot of people is the thought of aging fish. Uh, and it's not necessarily an easy thing to do in your home, in your home fridge. You need to do it well. You do need slightly specialised, a slightly specialised chiller. So it's it's not something that everyone can do all that easily. But mm. it's something to consider. It's something to keep in mind. Um, if a fish is is killed and prepared the right way, then it can be aged to a certain degree in your in your fridge at home. Maybe don't stick it, you know, hanging on top of your missus's broccoli and things like that. But if you've got a, maybe a beer, a beer fridge uh, that has got a bit of space to hang, I think hanging it is a great option if you can. Mm. It really lets that air get all around the fish rather than yep. having it sitting in a, in a, in a dish. Or, or um, A lot of guys are quite good by making sure the fish isn't sitting in its own juices because that's, that's no good. But... Is, is the main issue with using a traditional refrigerator, is it, is it the lack of humidity control? Yeah. Yeah. And, and airflow, again, you don't want moist air sitting around that fish. So either whether that, that moisture has been removed through uh, some sort of dehumidifier or, you know, the humidity control within a fridge mm. um, or some sort of fan. Okay. Um, Either of those options will, will ha- really help you. Mm. Uh, I mean, some of these new fridges you get, they've got sort of those, those drawers, um, you know, which you know, might be crisp, you know, keep your veggies crisp. Um, yeah. I, have, I have found that they have potential. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's something to look at. If you've got one of the, a new fridge or a decent fridge with some of those drawers with different, different controls, mm. try those. They're something you can use to, to keep your fish in really good condition. Buying a set of spearfishing fins can be quite a huge decision. When you finally decided to get off the plastic blades and head into either composites or carbon fibre, you want to make sure that you're making the right decision. I've got a couple of tips and pointers to you brought today, brought to you by penetratorfins.com. Now, when you buy a set of carbon fibre or composite fins, you want to make sure that it's comfort paired with efficiency but you also want longevity out of it because it's a huge investment. Now, sometimes the lightest fin in the world may feel great, but think about what that fin's going to look like in three years of of hardcore spearfishing use. Will the fin still be doing the job that you want it to in three years? Make sure also that you get exactly the right size foot pockets and wear the dive socks, like when you try them on, that you will be wearing with them in the pool in the ocean. And that way you'll have a really good idea. You don't want any slop or play in the pocket when you, when you, when you, when you fit the pockets and when you make sure you, when you're buying it. You want you, you want them tight, but you don't want to restrict circulation either, because you can all end up with all sorts of cramping issues. Getting that that the blade 
pocket partnership ride is crucial as well. And if you head in if, or if you talk to Larry Gray at penetratorfins.com, he will not do you wrong. His before and after sales service is beyond compare, as is his warranty. It's Australian made. You can't go wrong. Check it out, penetratorfins.com. If you do decide to purchase for a limited time only, it's $25 off any set of fins, penetratorfins.com. Check them out. Spearing Magazine are the world's premier spearfishing magazine. It's a publication for Spearos by Spearos. It's full of just hard-charging articles to inspire your next spearfishing adventure. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. I'd love to get sort of your advice on, right, so on this podcast, we talk a lot about shooting fish. Um, we don't even spend a lot of time talking about what happens after the fact. I'd love to get your perception of good care of, of fish after you shoot it. So from the time it lands in the boat or back on the shore, what, what should, how should we be treating a fish? Well, it's, I don't think it's, it's not rocket science. Obviously, most fish are, are ickied, you know, the, the knife to the brain. Um, that's your first port of call. I think bleeding it is, is a good one. So you cut the gill rakers out? Yeah, get rid of the gills. You don't need the gills. Um, and they're they are one of the first things that are going to spoil uh, is, you, is the gill. So always get those out as quick as you can. I think for us as recreational sparrows, um, taking the guts out in the water is a good, yeah. is a good ploy. And, and then just stuffing them with ice. Um, getting that slurry going, salt ice and, and some, and some seawater, and you'll get a good slurry. I, th- I think don't take the fillets off until you're in a really good, clean environment. Um, yeah. And again, like we're, like we're learning, is you don't really want to be washing your fillets. Mm. They don't, you don't want to be adding any water to them. So that's that. To do that well, it comes down to having a good um, environment for, for filleting. Just shout yourself a good nylon, a good nylon board, um, mm. chopping board. They're cheap. Timber timber's okay, but it needs a good scrub. You need to be able to scrub it down really well. Yep. And just by by not having the guts already removed, you're removing so much of that nasty bacteria which can cause the fish to spoil mm. and just cleaning your knife don't let too much of a build up just have a bucket of water next near, nearby and just dunk your knife in a bucket or just give it a rinse under the tap or the hose um, keep your knife clean and just give the board a bit of a rinse every now and again okay if, if, if it's getting a bit dirty uh, and then just put your fillet skin side down um, so that that you know the flesh is not necessarily touching the board and again, you know, once you skinned, skinned your fish, you can often leave the fillet sitting on the skin and then to do any boning, you've got to take the pin bones out uh, or the rib bones, do that, try and do that on top of the skin and then, you know, then you're away. Okay, cool. Next, next. Uh, so that sounds pretty good. So try and minimise any sort of moisture you're getting on the fillet is a, is a big message. And it, that, that was something I learned from uh, Josh's book as well. So. Um, Okay, let's get into what kinds of fish work best, particularly for, for, for smoking. Okay. First up, oily fish. They smoke up really well because they retain moisture. So around the world, your mahi-mahis, they, they smoke up really well. Your, your Spanish mackerel or your, um, your king, king mackerel, mackerel. Yeah, as people call them, walu in the Pacific. Um, they're a great fish. I mean, they're good for anything, those things, aren't they? They're beautiful fish. Oh, they're so good smoke, though. So yeah, good. Yeah, they are. And then a lot of your, ma- obviously, you know, your, your English mackerel or your, blue, your slimy blue mackerel. Um, Trevally. I mean, Trevally, to me, are a really underutilized fish. I mean, maybe not so much with sparrows. I mean, I think a lot of sparrows really do recognize the, the eating qualities of, of Trevally. Most Trevally, mm. I mean, there might be a few species overseas, which I'm not familiar with. What about giant trevally? Have you tried smoking that? No. Um, I mean, the thing is, you can smoke some quite shit fish. Yeah. And it'll still taste good. Yeah. 
that's that's the beauty of 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 smoking trash. Um, so I've got no reason to doubt why a GT wouldn't taste pretty good smoked up. Mm. You'd need a smoker bloody your size to cook them. They're, they're that big though. Like you well, you, you would. shoot it. Yeah, they're, they're massive animals. Yeah, and then and then yeah, that comes down to um, portioning it too. You probably wouldn't be smoke. You wouldn't want to, You'd want to portion up quite well to to make the most use of of it. So how how thick? Um, should the fillets be like to go th- to smoke up? Well, um, is this a religious question? On, uh, no, it's, no it's, it depends on on um, your smoker. Obviously, it's good to get everything quite a uniform thickness, so everything cooks quite evenly. Although you do get in some smokers, once you get to know them, you'll have hot spots or you'll have cool spots. You'll have areas in your smoker which. We'll, we'll cook fish at different times, uh, different temperatures. Uh, and once you know that, you put your thicker pieces where it's hotter, you put your, your smaller pieces where it's a bit cooler. But, yeah, I, I, I think it's more about getting them a more of a uniform thickness, whether you, okay. they're all, you know, the size of a grapefruit or they're slightly smaller than that. I don't think it makes too much difference. Okay, cool. All right, Brian, um benefits uh, like um, my, my mate he doesn't like the brine at all um, he can't seem to get it right last time um, I had some something he brined it was just quite salty and it dried out a little bit um, however without brine he hot smokes a lot of stuff and I friggin love it um, particularly the mackerel and stuff like that no brine at all just hot smoked um, like a couple, couple of hours in there overnight he leaves it in the smoker cooling off and the next day it's just Unbelievable. I mean, I haven't heard of most ever fish that I've you know heard of when it's smoked. It's, it's it is brine to some extent. Mm. Um, so talking about brining, you've got you've got two options. You've got your wet brine, which is immersing the fish in a big tub filled with a salty, often sugary brine with guys add all sorts of different spices and alcohols, and then you've got your dry brine where you just more of a you're sprinkling salts and sugars and oh, so you still call that a brine, do you? You still well, I do. I call that a I call that a dry brine. Yeah, right. um, just it's same as when you're doing bacon. Really, you know, you have a wet. You can have wet brines and and, and dry brines. So, personally, at the Matakana Smokehouse, we we always go with a dry brine. It's what I it's what I knew. It's what I have developed and. Mm. And I, but in saying that, I know lots of guys who will religiously use a wet brine, and and they love it, and, and that's awesome. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to smoking fish. You know, everyone's got their own recipes. You know, their grandfathers did it like this. You know, and that gets that's why you now do it the way you you prefer. Often you hear if you're doing a wet brine, um, you want the fish just to to, to float. But that's when you've got the salinity at the right level. It's when the fish just starts to float a wee bit. Okay. Um, I mean, there's, you guys can Google stuff about, you know, one cup of salt, you know, per two liters of water. You know, there, there's all sorts of ratios around and things like that. I suppose what I could say to a certain extent is ingredients-wise is just do use good ingredients. Don't use iodized salt. Rock salt. Yeah, use rock salt or, or, or sea salt. Sea salt's expensive, or, you know, but it's worth it. You know, it's, it gives it. Well, just don't use iodized. That's that's all I'll say on salt. Um, You're pretty particular with the ingredients you use there. It's all organic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, where possible, um, some things we use we can't that we can't get organic. But one thing I do really like, and I and I think guys should try it, is possibly using um, coconut sugar. Okay, it's reasonably common these days. It's getting cheaper. It's not that much more expensive than a decent organic brown sugar. It, the coconut sugar gives a really good color to the fish. A lot of commercial guys, you look on the on the ingredients of a commercial um, mackerel or, or carwai or trevally in the, in the supermarket, there'll be an additive, a uh, color additive, artificial, and I don't know why they should do that. It's it, it's it's not necessary. Um, mm. So we use we use an organic coconut sugar, uh, and that gives a beautiful colour. It's not too sweet, 
so it just fits in well with with how we pair our fish and i i, I always recommend it to to guys at home to 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 tr- give it a try do, do guys when they're sort of experimenting with their own smoked fish recipes uh, do they do they try and add too much i think you're right shrek at times guys do go too hard um and one on that point um you know guys who, who they'll use whiskey and and rum and um you know they can and these are all good ingredients and when used in the right way um maple syrup's a good one but you need the most important ingredient when you're smoking a fish is well when you're brining a fish is salt and you've got to let the salt do its job if you start adding too much to it the salt will get diluted and it won't be able to do its job properly because the salt is a, is a very necessary if you want to do a smoked fish right you've got to let the smoke do its job and that's to to well not so much at home but in a commercial sense you've got to let the smoke out uh, the salt kill kill bacteria and eliminate mm. any future bacteria growth and it and it also dehydrates dries the fish out you need you need to have your fish dried out to a certain extent that really helps the shelf life and having that loss of moisture through the dehydration helps preserve the fish and this is important in a commercial sense it's not quite so important for for um you know you guys at home doing it but it will improve the the flavor you're just concentrating the flavors by removing a lot of that water content you're 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 enhancing the flavor of the fish you're letting the, the saltiness come through you know, a slight sweetness with the sugar because sugar sugar can be important too. Sugar is a curing agent, okay. Um, so it, it is a good thing to use. But in saying that, it's great to experiment with your whiskies and your rum. You know, they've got that that alcohol which helps preserve and, and kill kill nasties. So, mm. I mean, experimentation is great, but it's good to keep let that salt um, really do its job. All right, so. Um... We've, we've talked a bit about brine, dry and wet, and we've talked about cooking times and different smokers. Um, I guess the part that I like the best is, is eating it. Um, <laughs> so you can just eat smoked fish while it's straight out of the smoker. You can vacuum pack it and pull it out in a few days. Um, you guys do various sort of smoked fish dishes, I see, like some wicked salads and stuff. Um, what are some of the other favourites for serving smoked fish? Well, as you say, it's, you pretty much can't beat smoked fish straight out of the smoker. Warm, warm smoked fish is probably the best way to have it. But then once you've, um, you know, you chuck it in the fridge. Um, if it's been well smoked and well cured, you know, it'll sit in the fridge for, for a long time. We, we often will, will make a, a kedgeree, which okay. is that sort of English-Indian hybrid. You know, you use a good sort of mackerel or carwai or trevally. That's a that's a really good option. I mean, here in New Zealand, the old smoke fish pie is pretty iconic. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. a pretty it's pretty good. A pate, yeah. um, especially if you've got a bit of dirty old something that's been frozen and been you know sitting in the back of the freezer for a while. Pull that out. You know, mix that through with some sour cream or creme fraiche capers. Yeah. You know, guys, a bit of smoky paprika. Um, lemon juice, black pepper, and that's always a winner. It's a great way. It's probably the best way to use a dirty old bit of smoked fish from the back of the freezer. You got things like uh, even just like a pasta dish. Just boil up some pasta, um, maybe chuck a bit of garlic and and um, some creme fraiche through it, and then just then just roll some some flakes some smoked fish through that pasta. Maybe a bit of you know wilted spinach to keep the missus happy, and <laughs> um, and and you're away. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, we often will just, you know, if you, you know, you're, you're scratching it for what to have for dinner, you just make up some sort of, um, you know, soup and just break a bit of smoked fish through that soup and it just improves it in a, in a good way. So, one of my faves is just the old um, hot smoked fish in a fresh bread sandwich with butter. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty versatile, you know, ingredient to use. Yeah, it's, I think smoking fish maybe makes it more versatile, though, doesn't it? In some ways, yeah, I think so. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good thing. Yeah, you know, people have it for breakfast. You can you know chuck a bit of smoked fish through the old um, scrambled eggs. 
Oh. Um, yeah, as I say, for, for, for lunch, you got your, your smoke fish sandwiches and, or a salad, some, you know, smoke fish through the old green salad. And then for dinner, you got all sorts of options. Yeah, so I reckon it, it's really versatile. And it keeps, doesn't it? It keeps much better than fresh fish. It's always good to have a bit of smoke fish sitting in your fridge somewhere. So one thing I've picked up as well, I think, just chatting with you, is the sort of the, that, that dichotomy of uh, formula versus sort of art. Is it, a, is it a science or is it, a, is it an art? What do you think? From a commercial point of view, um, <laughs> there, has to be, there has to be science to it for us. Um, yeah. You know, as the, as the world uh, that we know, you know, everything is governed by someone. You know, in our case, it's uh, you know, Ministry of Primary Industries. Yeah, you've got to have you've got to have your your processes done right. But for you know, for us at home, for you guys at home, I'd like to think it's more of an art. Um, you know, it's something that's been that's been passed down through the generations, mm. um, and it's a great thing to experiment with. Your different brines, cures, herbs. A lot of guys um, will chuck, you know, some sort of herb. You know, on top of the fish, or I often like, you know, if you're doing things at home, just grab some old rosemary branches or, or thyme and just throw that on the fire, okay, or in your in your smoke box, and um, and that that'll put a nice little flavour through the fish. Yeah, so it, it, I, I I always recommend guys just to to give it a go, you know, experiment with it and try different things. But there are, yeah, you know, there's just a few. You just want to get a few things right. And everything else you can play around with. Awesome. Last question, pretty much wrapping out with uh, smoking is: uh, what about smoking everything else we catch in the sea, like um, you know, different mollusks and um, shellfish and you know, octopus, squid, uh, mussels, wh- wh- whatever else? Well, here in New Zealand, and I think around the world, mussels are, are a big one. Mm. Um, and uh, and you know, a smoked mussel again is pretty good. With a, with mussel, or, yeah, and same with oysters. Smoked oysters are pretty good. They're quite um, tricky, the old oysters, because they're quite delicate and small. Mm. But a wet brine is probably the way to go. Just uh, you know, half a cup of salt, half a cup of sugar, a couple of liters of water, and just throw them in there for uh, overnight or or five or six hours. And the, and you want to dry them. Just going back to to, to smoking in general. You don't. You want to be putting fish or, or, or anything in the smoker. You want it dry or tacky. You mm. don't want dripping wet anything going in the smoker because smoke and the flavour won't adhere to it. Uh, you need that that nice dry tacky coating uh, mm. for um, smoke and heat uh, and flavour to adhere to. So how do you do that when you're wet, Brian? You want to take it out. You want to put it in the fridge. Or chiller overnight. You you really you just put it in there and you and let the chiller the 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 chiller the fridge do its job and it'll it'll produce a nice dry tacky you know layer to the fish and it's key it's it's a really good part of it. Color it'll it'll add color to the fish because mm. um, that smokiness will will stick to the to the fish um, and you'll get a better a better colored fish. Or, or, or mussel or, or oyster that's a good a key part that needs to be um, thought about have you tried octopus in a smoker no but um, you know that time will come our mate our mate Blair Herbert's always um, throwing you know ideas at me um, yeah. whether it be uh, the other day it was rabbit um, mm. ooh yum smoked rabbit smoked rabbit he, 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 he threw forward I think there's been crayfish um, put forward, which I think he's done at home. So, yeah, these are all things which which are good. I mean, obviously you got your um, your venison and, and beef and and, and pork. Um, mm. Probably when I talk about this, I mean more venison and, 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 and beef is again a good cure. Um, you want to really dry that dry that out, and then you make your brisolas, you know, your cured cured meats. Yeah, there's so many options when it comes to to smoking. I reckon smoked octopus is the go, just quietly. I, I reckon I've just got a sneaky suspicion that it could be good, but I think there'd be, a, as usual, there'd be 99 ways to bugger it up and probably one ways to do it right. 
you'd have to you'd have to bore the shit out of it for a while, I, I would imagine. Um, I don't know. Like I was in New Zealand recently, and the powers. Like I always thought you had to tenderize the hell out of them. Nah, um, Rochelle and Nat, they just um, boiled them while they were alive. Uh, blanch them like I think literally like minute 90 seconds and then they chop them up into chunks and they just cook them on the barbie like garlic and butter and they were the best powers I've ever eaten and um, cool. back in the day I used to put put them away I don't know if you could do something the same with octopus maybe blanch at first so, some of the Italians and, and Spanish people seem to cook it I've heard all sorts of stuff about milk and I mean, the vinegar one's another classic. I haven't really experimented myself enough to know, but um, I just think it's it's maybe it's an oily type um, composition. Maybe it'd go well, but I don't know. They are they have got that reputation for being rubbery at the wrong times as well. Yeah, yeah. I think the Greeks seem to be be the ones to talk to when it comes yeah. to uh, octopus. All things octopus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you, the thing is, you see them quite common. They're quite common around 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 our ways, so it'll be good to to you know experiment a bit with them. You'll have to name your first um, successfully smoked octopus after me. That'd be fantastic. Oh, mate, it'll be a pleasure. Way back in 2001, Adreno, or as it was then known, Adrenaline, was a tiny shop in the back streets of Woolloongabba. And at the time, it was nearly impossible to find decent spearfishing equipment, especially at an affordable rate. Since then, hundreds, thousands of people have discovered the joys of spearfishing through Adreno's store. They've gone on and built four stores all across Australia. We've got Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Perth. And their online shop at spearfishing.com offers a completely different experience than what we're used to finding online in the spearfishing world. If you want free information, you can check out their blog at spearfishing.com or their YouTube channel, shop at spearfishing.com.au. Use the code NoobSpero, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. And I know lots of noobers have made use of this code over the years. A big thanks to today's sponsor, Adreno. It's 2020 and it's time for a brand new sponsor, Killshot Spear Guns. Timber guns made in the USA. Simple, effective, dependable, made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin. These spear guns are an absolute work of art. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. And hey, I've got a special for you 30 bucks off user code NOOB. That's just NOOB, N O O B. For a limited time only, save $30 on any spear gun at Killshot Spear Guns. Save 30 bucks on any spear gun. Check it out. Let's move back into your spearfishing journey. Was there any um, sort of parting advice or anything that we didn't cover off with uh, smoking fish? No, I think I think we successfully got through those main those main points. Um, mm. For me, yeah, it's it's letting the salt do its job. It is drying the fish properly before mm. um, before smoking. And then air circulation seemed to be a, a big point as well, but that seems yeah. pretty tricky maybe in some of the um, home setups. Well, yeah, it can be tricky in, in those ones, you, you, one, the setups that you buy. But, you know, here in New Zealand, I know most guys have got a smoker sitting out the back. Whether it be an old garden shed or, or an old dunny, you know, you can just drill a few holes up the top and let that air escape and have, have little holes that you can close up if you want to, um, you know, have a little bit of timber that can slide across and um, that'll let moisture out and, and, then, and create, create a little bit of a, a wind funnel, you know, air getting sucked in through the bottom and then let it escape out through the top. Mm-hmm. Um, that'll, that helps create, create that airflow. Cool. Hey, let's move back into your spearfishing journey. So, um, What's a what's a fish maybe in the past or the present that you've uh, really enjoyed hunting, and and sort of how do you do that successfully? For me, uh, snapper here in New Zealand is it's a really good fish to hunt, and I know you've had lots of people on who who are much better snapper fishermen sparrows than me. But for me, it, it is it's really challenging. Um, you've really got to find them. You know, you, a lot of your, your kingfish and things like that they'll find you. Um, mm. Sure, you know they put up a hell of a fight. But it's the snapper which you need to really work hard for, and that's why I, I do enjoy it. 
you know, setting burlies or, or snooping. You do, you do a bit of both depending on sort of what's happening? Yeah, yeah, depending on the terrain. You know, if, if there's really good terrain, to be fair, I'll probably always do both. Okay. I'm always going to set a burley or two. Uh, and then while I'm, you know, waiting for those burleys to work, I'll, I'll be snooping nearby if it's possible. Okay. So just describe your burley process. You're doing a bit of a ground bait? Yep, yep. So often um, I, I've found that I do like to use fish and often I will take something from the smokehouse. Um, you know, whether it be you know old kingfish frame or, or or something, I'll take a bit of fish or I'll shoot something, and combine that with kinna, the sea urchins. Yeah, I, I I think I have found that big fish will hang about better with some sort of fish in the burley. Okay. Um, yeah. Now with the kinna, you know the little guys will get in there and and. You know, they'll hammer away at it and the big guy will, might just hang back. But if there's, you know, some fish up for offer, then they'll, they'll get stuck into it. Something a bit more substantial. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's been my experience. Just walk us through it. So you maybe you find a, a good lie for where you want the ground bait to be. Do you take your kingfish frame down there and then put the kinners on top of it, smash it up and then leave a rock on top of the, uh, the kingfish frame or...? Is that one way you'd maybe do it? I'm just chucking out ideas here. Yeah, yeah, no, no, totally, Shrek, you're onto it there. I don't have any any strict rules, but finding the right location is key. You've got to you've got to be able to a approach without them seeing you. But firstly, which is tricky for a lot of guys, is actually if it's a new area that you haven't dived a lot before, is actually navigating back to where you put the burley. Yeah, yeah. That's often tricky. I mean, you can you do use it or drop float, but then you got to be careful that the float doesn't then, you know, the line doesn't swing back over the burley and spook the bigger fish. You know, bigger fish yeah. can get spooked quite easily. They're not big by being silly. So what do you do? You triangulate with something on the shore, and I try to. Yeah, I'll try and just work it out. But if you're lucky enough to be diving the same spots quite regularly. It becomes much easier, and you and you know where they are. You know where your where your little bombies and your and your drop offs are, and you can make your way back there quite easily. Yeah, interesting. I've given it a little bit of thought, but this is probably yeah, this is a, a bit of a new idea for me. I haven't really thought about combining different types of burley. So just for people that aren't familiar, I mean, kinner is sea urchin, so we're talking about laying a, a frame down and then breaking up these sea urchins on top of it, and then uh, I guess you you. You know, because the sea urchin on its own gets eaten quite quickly, like I think like what you identified. So yeah. the the bigger snapper are really staying around for something more that'll offer more sustained interest to them, I guess. So that's uh that's cool. Yeah, that's been my experience anyway. Yeah, cool, cool. What about tough situations in the ocean? You've uh you've done some yachting, so I'd imagine that uh did you hear how I said yachting then? Yachting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a, that's a bit of a dream of a lot of people, I think, is to get away and, and spend some significant time out living aboard a yacht. What's the reality of it? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was it was it was it was amazing. It was a great great couple of years. You know, you don't you don't get too many opportunities in, in your life where you can just put your tools down for two years and just sail and and cruise and explore and and fish and, and spearfish. So yeah, well, we're, we're very lucky to be able to do that. You know, we did have a couple of tough situations. At one point, well, not at one point, we were we were three days out from Panama uh, en route to the Galapagos and we got demastered. We lost our mast. Holy shit. Which is obviously quite a key piece of equipment. <laughs> um, so it was, a, it was just a, a, a gear failure within a sort of a stainless, a stainless steel fitting. So, you know, stainless steel is a, is a fantastic product, but it's often difficult to see what's happening inside it. Stainless steel is good until it's not, really. Um, and, and, it, and it snapped, and I was lucky probably not to lose my head as sort of the, the, the base of the stay, the back stay, got catapulted forward, sort of whistled past my head at a great rate of knots. So that was, a, that was a tough situation. We had to turn around, you know, radio. We were lucky we had a sat phone, so we called first you know our parents and then they contacted the New Zealand Coast Guard and the New Zealand Coast Guard got in touch I think with the 
with uh, with I think maybe Panama or US Coast Guard, and but we we were lucky we had enough fuel to motor all the way back to Panama, where we we stayed for an extra three or four months and got a new <laughs> sails and and mast and had quite a bit of work done to the boat actually okay. before before we we took off again. So so that was a that was a tough situation. Yeah, for sure, man. What about funnier stuff? Who do you go spearing with there in New Zealand most of the time? You got a good bunch of buddies around where you live? Uh, yeah, we do. I do. Um, I know it's a it's a controversial one, but I, I do spear quite a bit on my own. I don't go deep. I don't. I don't. I don't go far. It's mainly shore diving when I'm on my own. But you know, there's a good there's a good group of guys here um, in that Mat- in the Matakana area. Yeah, so so it's it's like we're lucky. It's a good and it's a good area. It's good shore diving. You know, obviously at the moment with the old COVID uh, nineteen, there's no boating, so you got to you know your shore's your only option. But uh, yeah, when when all this passes and and you know obviously before we've got good boats that you can use and you know there's it's great spearing you know from here on the on the coast and then you know out to Little Barrier, Cowell. Cowell's got some great options. Yeah, you guys are a bit sport. You got lots of options on your doorstep, and the weather yeah. I think there is is pretty good too most of the time. Yeah, weather's good. You've always got um, uh, mostly it's westerly, which is offshore, so you can always find somewhere to tuck in out of the wind, and the water never gets too cold. You know, summer I think a lot of guys probably probably dive in, in three mils, and then in winter a five mil. Yeah, um, yeah. So you never get too cold. Mm. Mm. All right, cool. Um, any funny stuff? Funny story you want to share? We were we were free diving with uh, manta rays. I think it was in in the Tuamotus, and it wasn't me. I think it was my missus or my, or maybe her sister. And she she was free. We were just free diving. She was down, sort of following along <laughs> behind this manta ray when it let out this almighty crap, just this big cloud just blossomed into the water right sort of in a, you know right where she was swimming into i mean i know that you love a good poo story so i thought i I'd do. just um I do. yeah i thought i'd um the old manta ray that'd be a good video for reality versus expectations you know because you see a lot of the other the, the glamour side of manta rays on instagram i just think that that would be a good just reality depiction yeah it would be it would be it happens probably more often than you think too yeah, well, animals got a shit too. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Cool, man. Hey, let's let's uh, wrap it up with a Spiro Q and A, which is sort of a faster paced um, round of questions. But um, what resources did you use to learn spearfishing? A lot of trial and error, really. For me, I've always enjoyed just the the free diving aspect. Um, yep. So for a long time. You know, when I was younger, just being in the water, as you know, a lot of, a lot of guys say. But I was happy if I if I didn't shoot anything, it didn't bother me. I just liked to be there and have a gun in my hand and and, and just missioning around, seeing fish and and trying. And um, if I didn't shoot anything at the end of the day, it didn't bother me, and it still doesn't bother me. But you know, then then I meet a few guys and a few of the local boys, and that that you know, we started heading out together. And and I, some of them were, were were much better divers than me. And you know, you learn learn from them, mate. I've learned I've learned a lot from from the News Bureau podcast. To be fair, hmm. yeah, you know, there's oh, been sweet. some amazing, mate, amazing guys um, and girls, you know, sharing their insights. Um, so that's definitely been something where I've where what I've learned. Cool. Well, that that sounds like not unusual to a lot of us. It's always a bit of a trial and error, and it's good to have some help along the way, though, whether it comes in the form of mates or a club or. Um, some sort of online resource as well, so that's cool. Um, if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? I don't think I'd do anything differently. I, I mean, it, w- it would have been good to have that, you know, a really good earlier mentor, um, mm. or you know, a really good diver who who really showed me a lot from earlier on. But you know, you don't it didn't happen. It didn't happen. No, I've been lucky. You know, I haven't. There's been nothing really that that I would have done differently. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, philosophical question to finish. 
Can you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence or maybe two? I like the silence of spearfishing. I like being underwater. I like the silence of it. It gives you time to think and just be on your own in your own little bubble. I run like using that term at this time of our life. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I like, I like being in my little bubble when I'm, when I'm spearfishing. That's cool. Good, man. Um, all right, where can people come and find you? Um, so we've got Matakana Smokehouse. What's, the, what's your website? Uh, it's just www.matakanasmokehousenz.com. Okay. Yeah, so we've got a good website there. Um, you can order things or just give us a call if you're you know, local Sparrow, uh, want to get some fish smoked. Yep. Obviously, we vacuum pack everything, 30-day shelf life on anything, on anything, you know, vacuum packed. Hmm. Yeah, so that's that's the business. You're on Facebook, Mat- Matakana Smokehouse NZ, uh, Instagram? Yeah, Instagram's probably our, our main one these days. Um, but I think everything from Facebook, uh, from Instagram gets fed through to Facebook. Uh, and then Mike Lisby, uh, I think, on Instagram. But, um, cool. I'll link, um, I'll link all that stuff up in today's show, not- show notes. So um, we'll call it noobspiro.com forward slash smoker. And uh, I'll link up a whole heap of stuff that we've chatted about today, including all, all of your socials and stuff. So if people want to connect with you, Matakana Smokehouse NZ, just about everywhere. But um, that was magic. Just as a parting um, thing, are you part of the uh, Eat What You Kill Facebook group? I am. Is that Blair Herbert's group? <laughs> you know the gag too. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, the poor old Tim Caverman, uh, he copped it with that one. But um, it's a bloody good group, especially for, you know, um, fish, fish show uh, connoisseurs, which you are yourself one of. Yeah, you're right. It has. It's been. It's. It's really. Um, Tim has done it really well. He's done it well. You know, he 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 leads the way with his posts. Yeah, there's some great photography. Good, you know, original recipes. Recipes. We've added a few ourselves. I've got a couple of really good ones in mind. I'm just waiting on. Um, I'm waiting on uh, on myself to shoot to shoot a few more fish. To be fair, so I can, you know, get a bit of raw material to 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 utilize. Hopefully when the Rona finishes, um, you'll be able to get out and do a bit more. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So looking forward to it. Hey, Michael, um, absolute pleasure to um, catch up with you today and uh, and good to say hello again after meeting you in New Zealand uh, momentarily. I really appreciated the favour you did for me. Oh, just as an aside too, did you eat that? Uh, did you do it, get in to do anything with that row I gave you? Yep. Yep. We, we smoked that up and, um, yeah, mate, a lot of people were happy with that. We have lots of regulars who come in, and and I often will just give them, you know, bits and pieces as a as a thank you, or you know, to sweeten the deal. So yeah. I use that row. Often, always people asking for row, and it's hard to get. Um, yeah. So, mate, that was much appreciated. Thank you. Oh, well, good. I, I I was interested in eating some of it myself, but unfortunately, time didn't allow it. Yeah, unfortunate. What it tastes like? Row's always got that slightly sweet. Sweet flavour to it, yeah. A lot of rows quite taste quite similar. Okay, just a yeah, a, a, a nice fishy flavour with with um, with a slight sweetness to it. All right, well, awesome, Michael. Uh, like like I said to everyone, my, uh, Matakana Smokehouse NZ on all the socials will be linked up in today's show notes at noobspirit.com forward slash smoker. Come and check it out and uh, say hello to Michael and uh, and have a look at some of the wicked recipes he's got on his socials. So. Um, yeah, awesome chatting with you today, man. Hey, thanks very much, Shrek. Mate, it's, 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 I've been obviously a long-time listener of the, of the, of the Noob Sparrow uh, podcast, so to add my little bit of uh, a contribution, it's, it's a privilege. Thanks for having us. Jeepers, that was a full-on episode with Michael there. Um, Matakana Smokehouse, if you're in the area, definitely head in and uh, have a chat with him. He's a mad dude, loves his sparing. And uh, as you'll see in today's show notes, there's a whole heap of pictures there with some of his catches over the years, and uh, they know how to smoke a good fish there at Matakana Smokehouse, I can guarantee you that. Um, One thing we didn't catch up with today was wood chips. 
and we missed that in the show so Michael's going to come back at some stage and we'll we'll get geeky about the different chips and stuff you can use um, to sort of flavour the smoke if you like and uh, but yeah hey hang around in two weeks we are off to talk with Evan Leeson and um, this guy flies under the radar a wee bit he's not really on the social media but um, he's a talented Spiro and um, this was a really informative interview so Oh, actually, I'm going to see you in a week because we've got an accelerated release schedule for this August. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Big thanks to Rob and Cornelian for the edit. If you're listening to the show, wherever you listen, I love it if you left a review, subscribe, all the good stuff. Um, if you want to hear more from Noob Spiro, come to noobspiro.com forward slash more stoke and sign up for the email newsletter. Catch you in one week for Evan Leeson. Thanks for listening. I've got a message for those of you that are just starting out. You are super curious about spearfishing and freediving, but you've got no idea. Uh, I have got a perfect offering for you. It's called Break the 10 Meter Barrier. And it's a course, it's an online video course, with training, and all the purpose of the course is to teach you the very basic techniques that can get you down to that first 10 meter bit and start enjoying the ocean. Whether you just want to go freediving or you want to start spearfishing, this has got a really great introduction to just give you the basic skills and knowledge you need in order to get down there and just start. It's a place to start. Now you can go to howtofreedive.com, check out the Break the 10 Meter Barrier course, and you can do that for free. If you like the style of the course and you can see that it's going to be something that you're interested in, you want to purchase, use the code NOOSPERO to save some DOSH, aka Cheddar, <laughs> aka Cheddar. I'm stealing that from Joe Rogan, but what do you do? Save some dosh, use the code NOOBSPIRO, get that in you.